Ahoy! Let's get back into circuits that perform arithmetic. In this video, we'll discuss some tractors, which compute the difference between two numbers. Note that we'll do a fairly quick run through this topic, because there's quite a bit of overlap between the structure of subtractors and adders, which we covered in detail a few lessons back. An example of 4-bit subtraction is shown at the bottom. In each column, the top number, or menu end, is being subtracted by the bottom number, or subtrahend. And there's also the possibility of subtracting 1 due to a borrow. We see this case in the third column, where the starting one first has 1 subtracted from it due to the needed borrow from the previous column. These bullets provide a few possible subtractions that may be encountered. All of them include three input bits, the given menu end A, the given subtrend B, and a possible borrow, little b sub n. There are two output values, the resulting difference, D, and whether or not a borrow is needed, B sub out. The first two examples show there is no difference between the subtrahend and the borrow. Both feature 1 minus 1, resulting in a difference of 0, with no need for a borrow. The next example shows 0 minus 1. To accomplish this, a borrow is needed, which gives us 1, 0 minus 1 in binary or 2 minus 1 in decimal. Therefore, the difference is 1, and because of that needed borrow, a 1 is indicated in the parentheses. The last example shows 0 minus 1 minus 1. Following the same procedure as the previous example, this would work as 2 minus 2, which yields a difference of 0. A borrow was needed to make that subtraction possible. To design a circuit to accomplish this, a truth table is made to summarize all eight of the possible subtractions. Then, this circuit is made to replicate the truth table. This is called a full subtractor. That term full is used to indicate that it can handle the borrow bit. Note the similarity to a full adder and its use of a carry bit. With a full subtractor made and converted into a device symbol, we can then build a parallel subtractor. We need one full subtractor for each bit of the input numbers. Then we link the borrow out from each less significant bit as the borrow in to each more significant bit. Again, note the similarities to the pattern we use for the parallel adder. It is nice to see a familiar pattern, but the same drawback exists with compounding propagation delays. It takes some time for signals to travel through each subsequent device. Down below, I show a couple test cases of this 4-bit subtractor. When looking at these, keep in mind two important things. This circuit does A minus B, not B minus A, and this borrow in is being subtracted. The first one has 6 minus 3 minus 1. The resulting difference is 2. The second one does 5 minus 7, with no borrow in. The result is negative 2. How can I read that? I must interpret in 2's complement form. This 5-bit output in binary reads 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Converting this to decimal yields negative 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2, or negative 2. Note that this B out bit will indicate the sign of the output. 1 means negative, 0 means positive. Another way of interpreting this is that a 1 means the B value is larger. A simple extension from here is to use this as an inequality comparator, but that's not the focus of this lesson. But this isn't the only way to do subtraction. Recall this slide from several lessons ago. It outlines how we can perform subtraction by 2's complementing the subtrahend and then adding it to the menu end. In other words, instead of doing a minus b, let's do a plus negative b. It is easy to convert that procedure into a circuit, especially since we recently built a negator. First, we negate b. The 2's complement operation is achieved first with the series of NOT gates, 
and then with an incrementer. This negative B value is then added to A through a 4-bit adder. Voila! We now have a subtractor made from two devices that were already in our toolbox. There's another reason for structuring the subtraction this way. We can easily adapt the circuit to allow us the option of either adding or subtracting, as you see here. This control switch determines the mode, with the notation telling us that 0 means add and 1 means subtract. As discussed in the negator lesson, this B value will be unchanged if the control equals 0, or it will be negated if the control equals 1. Whatever the choice, those four bits are then added to the A value to produce the final result. In short, the circuit performs either A plus B or A plus negative B. It is valuable having multifunctional circuits rather than separate devices for all the possible functions. So we often look for strategies like this, which combine similar operations. But as always, be very careful with how you interpret binary numbers. The slide shows three test cases for the same adder subtractor device. In the first one, the chosen mode is add, and the inputs are binary 1010 and 1001. The result is 10011. Assuming unsigned binary, this converts to decimal as 10 plus 9 equals 19. Good news there. But we could also read this in sign magnitude form, with the leading bit of each number indicating the sign. All of those are 1s in this case, which means they are all negative. The trailing bits tell us the magnitude, which here are 2, 1, and 3. In total, this shows that negative 2 plus negative 1 equals negative 3. Is the first or the second interpretation right? Yes. Each of them could be, depending on how they are applied in particular other circuits. But we can't properly interpret these in 2's complement form or 1's complement form. Also, even in the successful sign magnitude form, the inputs use 4 bits and the output 5. The other examples re-emphasize the same point, but with subtraction. The middle test shows 1010 minus 1001 equals 0001 with a carry out of 1. Here I am conveniently reading the output as 4 bits and not including the carry out. Assuming unsigned binary, this reads in decimal as 10 minus 9 equals 1. That sounds right. Assuming 2's complement form, this reads in decimal as negative 6 minus negative 7 equals positive 1. Again, that sounds right. But the interpretation would not work in different forms. And this final example can only be rightly interpreted in 4-bit 2's complement form. It tells us that negative 7 minus negative 6 equals negative 1 but unsigned form yields an incorrect result. We could spend the next 10 minutes walking through the situations where this circuit works for each form, but that's not the main point. The main point is that for any circuit you use or build in the future, you need to establish how it should be used. Ones and zeros are the only signals we have. They can be used in many different ways. As a final note here, the C-out bit does not work the same way as the borrow-out bit shown in the parallel subtractor. A1 does not necessarily indicate that B is larger than A. So what can we do? Well, maybe you are building a certain calculator that will happily use the adder subtractor just shown. Great, use it. Or maybe you like the functionality of the original parallel adders and subtractors and want to leave those unchanged. If so, you could build a circuit like this. It looks like a jumble of wires at first, but the layout is quite simple. We pass the input numbers into both the parallel subtractor device and the parallel adder device. Then we choose which operation we actually want through these muxes. The bottom mux outputs the 4-bit sum or difference. The top mux outputs the 1-bit carry out or borrow out. As usual, the choice is made through a control switch. One big idea to glean from this example is that multiplexers are your friend. 
This strategy of building circuits is a common one. It can be summarized like this. One, do all the operations you think you might want. And two, use MUXs to choose which operation you care about right now and ignore the rest. Is that adder subtractor better than the previous one? That's not such a simple question to answer. The first thing to do is to assess what functionality you need for a given application. For example, are you calculating with only unsigned numbers? And do you care about a borrow bit always indicating whether B is greater than A? If both circuits provide the functionality you need, then consider the cost, which generally comes down to two things, the number of gates needed and the overall propagation delay. I know I've mentioned propagation delay quite a bit, but haven't really explained what it is or how to calculate it. That's a teaser to keep you coming back for more. We'll get to it soon.